So I'd like to welcome everybody to this month's transformational dialogue, and it's really unique in a lot of ways. It's a very different topic, and it's a very different um, paradigm because I spoke to Mark, who's a friend, and we'll talk a little bit more about Mark. And I said, Mark, I'd like to interview you for this evening, and I'm working with this idea of a topic. And he said, great idea, but how about I interview you this time? So from the very beginning, I've been a little off-centered, a little off-kilter with this one, but I really, um, it's very personal to me. And it's one I've wanted to have for a long time. And I just didn't really have the idea of, oh, that was meant to be a dialogue. I've had this idea that this topic should be a book and somebody should write it. And I'm coming to think that maybe that's me because I keep saying that and nobody's doing it. At any rate, really tonight is about uh, the, the magicalness uh, uh, and the transformational quality of Whidbey Island. And it could be anybody's community, but that's ours. So that's the one we're going to speak to tonight. Um, I'd like to give a plug for Mark as, as his training in psychology and understanding of the brain. As a parent, he's got just a, he's written several books. His website um, and blog is just thousands and thousands of people listen every month. TheCommittedParent.wordpress.com. So please take a chance to look that up. Um, in the last few months, I've been enjoying his article so much, really. And so tonight is going to unfold. It's going to begin with a conversation between us. I really don't know what he's going to ask. We got together and shared ideas about what makes would be different and special. But I, don't, I haven't been able to see what on his papers, so I don't exactly know how tonight's going to unfold. And it'll just happen organically as living on would be happens that way. <laughs> with surprises along the way. So Mark, I therefore hand right. over the reins to you tonight. And the first surprise is I forgot to hit this. So, we're going to start now with beginning. Come on. There we go. Welcome to the dialogue with Mark Brady on the transformational, wonderful, magical land of Whidbey. All right. Here we go. So as Craig said, um, we can get it together and we walk our dogs together and yeah, I just thought it might be fun to turn the tables and hear from him and see what he has to do, see what it's like to be in the hot seat. Um, and we've gotten together a few times and batted around a few ideas and, you know, try to just get a sense of what would be really a benefit to you folks. Why, why, why would it be worth your while to come out here? Um, so we hope that's going to happen here today. So what we thought we'd start with is have Craig talk about his journey, how he got here. And then after that, go through, I'll be checking off things he covers. <laughs> and then after that, um, I'll have some questions for him. And then we'd like to, we're, we're going to offer an um, opportunity for you to do a sentence completion exercise with, you know, with us about this topic. Okay, take it away. How'd you get here? I'm really not prepared for this. Um, you know, I guess I want to look at what I want to say about that, because whenever I have a new patient that just moved to the island, I always ask that question, right? Don't we all? Of, all right, how'd you get here? And you sit down with a cup of coffee because you know it's going to be a story. Right? <laughs> Nobody just says, oh, my job moved me here, or, you know, I don't know. So there's always a story. Um, for me, th then you have to decide how big a cup of coffee you want. <laughs> so I'll keep it tight. Right, but poignant. Um, so I moved here eight years ago, but getting here was probably a 20 year journey. You know, it was really for me living in the Bay Area, so I'm from New Jersey to the Berkeley in the Bay Area um, for too long, for too many hot summers, for too congested, for all those things that squeeze and pop one out to Whitby. Um, and really in a, in a marriage that wasn't working and looking to find change and try to revive itself in some way. So long story was my ex-wife had lived in, in the Seattle area and there was this kind of vision for her of how special and wonderful the Seattle area was. And I didn't have that, but we came and started to visit and we visited the San Juan Islands and Orcas Island. And of course, how can you not absolutely fall in love with, you know, the islands? And then you have the reality check of, yeah, great, and how am I going to make a living? I'm going to be on a boat being a chiropractor from this island to this island, because surely I can't make a living on one island out there. And so for a couple of years, it was like, well, that would be a nice pipe dream, but 
who's going to really be able to do that. Um, I can't telecommute, so. Um, one summer there was a, 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 a vacation and we visited the three islands that were like little island masses off of Seattle, where maybe you could like live on but like commute to Seattle seemed like a possibility. So I'll never forget coming to two days on Whidbey, two days on Vashon, two days on Bainbridge. Two days on Whidbey, sitting on a perfect summer day at the edge cliff, looking at the eagles, flying over, having this incredible meal, people going, how are you today? And I'm like, oh my god, I'm getting like goosebumps, because really, it's, it was that vision of the land and the mountains and kind people and living out of the congestion. I mean, it was everything that I wanted. Um, but we said, let's go to the other islands. And, you know, it definitely wasn't Bainbridge for me, and it wasn't Ashton for me for different reasons. So we came back to Whidbey again, just to make sure it wasn't like the first island magic, right? And people at Red Apple would, like, ask you how you were today and, like, wait for an answer. Or the woman at Mirkirk Garden said, you should come stay with us. And I'm like, you run a B&B? No, you can just stay in our house. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And she's like, really? You'd love it in the springtime or whatever other season. And so thus began a journey of, yeah, but let's check it out in the winter. You know, how many people have done something like this? Some here? No, only me. Okay. So, <laughs> so we all go through our process of getting here. Um, and we'll discuss this more later, why. Like, why do we get pulled here and why once we're here is it, like, different? And we get that, uh-huh. So, got here. God, this is so funny being here, Glow. Um... Sorry, but the home that I lived in with my wife as we went through our separating times, Glow now lives in. So, which is always one of those, how small is the island type of things, right? Really small. Um, so anyway, long story was really that's how I got here. And then once I got here, it was really finally the feeling, you know what, I could die here. And that's really what I've been looking for. I don't know where my life is going to take me. I don't know how it's going to change, and it's fine if it does. But I have the feeling like I could be here the rest of my life, and that would be just fine and wonderful. And I had been looking for that deep sigh, that big, oh, I'm finally home feeling. And it was really the first time I ever had it. I mean, you have it at home as a kid, sort of, but it's not by choice in the same way. So this was really, for me, the first adult choice of, wow, this is home for me. So but dying here is not going to be soon. Not, not by my intention. <laughs> so anyway, so that's how I got here. So one of the things we talked about was um, what makes, I mean, all islands are, are unique, but what makes Whitby unique as an island? It's a good question. I mean, I'm certainly not the expert on for the you, answer, for but you. for me, yeah. um, we had talked a little bit, and I like this, that it's human nature to look for transcendence. That there's this thought that as humans, we move in that direction. It's kind of this thrownness or this path that's laid out that we follow or we don't, we make left or right turns. But I think that there's something about the land and the community and the way that Whidbey is, and I'm going to say especially the South End, because that's my experience, um, that forces one to make choices to live authentically, I think. Because I think it's, I don't know if it's different in any other smaller community, because I haven't lived in very small communities. But you never know who's watching you run a stoplight. You never know if you forgot something in the store that they're going to bring it back to your house. So there's this whole way in which we live in the way I would say, you know, when I used to have this idea of like, you can't outrun God, he's like watching all the time anyway, so why even bother trying? So it's that idea of like, we're, not that I'm being watched, but I'm being witnessed all the time. So there's something about having a boundary of an island, about coming on and off it as like a ceremony, I mean, especially on the south end with the ferry. So it brings some sense of ritual to living here. So it's much different than if you were to go over the ferry. For me it is. I'm, I come across the south end and there's a decompression, on the ferry there's a decompression, there's an opportunity, even if you stay in your car, which is different, but straight away, there's still something about that crossing that has something ritualistic about it for me. There's something about the boundary of um, you can't just leave any time you want, right? 
Um, so there's some sense of having to rely upon things and others. You can't have everything you want in the moment you want it. You can't go to Costco now, all right? You can't have this thing now. You can't have McDonald's now. So all those things, um, I think, make us more conscious of our choices. <laughs> And I think that there's enough of those combined with the diversity of population, that diversity, not racial population, but diversity of personality and backgrounds, diversity um, of land, of agrarian, of neighborhood, of more intense, and all those different aspects together, I think just really combine with what some would say has a real sacred background as well, okay, um, to really coalesce and move one and push one in the direction that one was meant to go, however long that journey is here. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Try. <laughs> um, you and I talked a little bit about your experience um, of uh, road rage on Whitby. <laughs> road rage on Whitby, huh? Okay. And well, the, go, no, no, go ahead. So I wanted to, I, I thought that would be a fun story <coughs> to tell here, but also I'd be interested in just hearing in general your your own personal experience of people who live here with you. I think that there's a drop in pace that takes a period of time when you move from suburbia or the city or the big city or America to here. And I think that that length of time that it takes to adjust varies with people. Um, you know, it's funny thinking of other people that have come here, you know, whether it's vacationing or first move here, and it's like, come on, you don't have to do 50, there's no policeman there, right? Um, until you settle into this place of you don't want to do more than 50. Mm -hmm. and But it takes, it took me a while to do that and to like drop in where that's what I wanted and that's what I was comfortable with. So um, several lessons were learned in the story that I shared with Mark were, um, yes, there was a time that I drove in such a way that I kind of cut somebody off, I admit it. Well, then I noticed this person following me from Clinton <laughs> to Langley, but that's not unusual because there's only so many roads to go and many people are going to Langley. Until I started to pull into, it was actually I was singing at the Open Circle Singers, until I pulled in the back of the parking lot and noticed that he did the same thing. And now I'm starting to get a little scared. And he comes out, of the, you know, I tried when it first happened to wave, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see you, I apologize. Well, he lost and he's like, do you know what the... You're the chiropractor, aren't you? <laughs> oh my god, my practice is dead and I never can barely start it. Like, yes, I am, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. And, he's, and he lost it, you know, at that moment. And I was like, and then I realized in this moment, I'm going to see this guy again and again, and I'm not going to know how to handle it. And, and I do, and we never really healed it, so I see him on occasion, I just hope he doesn't remember, because I look different than I did with him. <laughs> but it was, it was that first real experience of, wow, you're seen here, yeah. right? And you can't just disappear in the crowd. There was really that feeling in the Bay Area that if you did something right or wrong, that it really wasn't a witness or seen, or you'd never hear from them again. And that did not exist, and that was one of my first lessons in that. Many more after that, but that was the first. Do you want to share another one? No. <laughs> Maybe later. Well, that's a good segue to this uh, this next question, which is, how would how might you describe uh, with Beyond's on your belly or shadow? Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. I think that really the under belly or shadow would be at whatever space one is in when one's experiencing something. So I think two people can experience the same things, and for one, it's a shadow story. For other one, it's that's the way it is here, you know. But when all of a sudden you share something confidential with one person, and then it comes around and hits you this way, and if you're not used to that, mm. that can be a real shadow story that you're going through. Vulnerability and embarrassment. So, of course, now I have to tell a story. Um, okay. So, there was a... Yeah, this was a good one. But it was also a real... This is a good example, actually, of it being both. So I was in the middle of my divorce, and um, with my ex at the time, and, and we were emailing personal information back and forth. 
and that was the way we were communicating at that time. And it got to the point where um, we were doing financial information back and forth in, in the divorce. And um, God only knows how God worked in this, but after I hit send, I noticed that she wasn't the only one on the two. <laughs> oh, yeah. That somehow the subsidiary of category of allied health providers on the island that I've been accumulating had also been CC'd after I hit send. Now, the really funny part was I just had had um, lunch with a good friend, actually, Marianne Rodmacher. And we were talking about um, creating our stories and books and, and different things, because that's one of the things she loves to do, and mentoring people and writing. And I was talking about, you know, I thought I was going to write a book about something a long time ago, but I, realized, I came to realize a few years ago that it was going to be something about my life. It was going to be something about my direct experience of life that was really the only unique thing that I had to share. So I get back and I do this and I call her, I'm like, oh my God. We just talked about creating stories about personal reveal and like, and the other part that we were talking about was I said what I really wanted for myself here at that time was a sense of authenticity and transparency. Really the words I <laughs> so I saw the email go out. I, just, I I can't even describe the body sensation that I felt at the time because this was literally her worst nightmare. I mean, really for her. I mean, so there was deep pain for me because. She was a very private person, and to have something like that be exposed was, was as bad as just something I could have created and purposefully if I wanted to. So, you know, huge guilt, huge out of controlness. Um, and all I could do was then write the people on the list and say, obviously, you know, it was an attachment. Please don't open this. It's very private and personal information and disregard this. And, but the amount of support that I got back, I got back to the office, I remember from lunch. And my assistant said, um, somebody had called um, and said, please don't open any emails, don't even look at your computer right now, and give me a call. I'm like, what is going on? Actually, that was Alina. Um, that's my <laughs> present wife, because um, she saw what had happened. And anyway, so in that story of incredible shadow, pain, vulnerability, um, oh my God, this community is so small, there's going to be so many ramifications of all this actually came huge support, huge compassion, huge heartfelt connection with people that understood how hard that was. So I guess any opportunity or anything that happens on the island here that's, that touches one can either touch one in a way that's a painful shadow side of being exposed for something and at the same time can create incredible connection and, and beauty too. So I don't think the island has a shadow side in of itself. I think all experiences are show it differently. So it's sort of like a pit in place from the bizarro world. Exactly the way that I had everything what? reversed. Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. I would like to add something to that. I was one of the recipients. And uh, <laughs> I opened it up and I saw that you know, it was very confident and so forth. And so I immediately uh, responded saying that I don't think that was your intent. And I felt uh, just sort of amusingly watching the process unfold, uh, how gracefully you acknowledged the error and asked for forgiveness. And uh, it just seemed to uh, settle. And uh, I probably forgot all the details. <laughs> But it was it was actually a quite a heartfelt experience. I was uh, happy to participate in it. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Is there anybody here who's never sent an accidental email? <laughs> <laughs> the accidental phone calls are worse. <laughs> it, it is warm in here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, speaking of warm, can you say a little bit about the weather? You know, the, so this was actually your thought. We were talking about um, challenges, or what would be the word I'm looking for? I think there are mileposts that people often have to face with being here if they're meant to be here. And I think weather is like one of those things that are, that's a separator. 
of many people that come here with the idea of the land and the people, and they fall in love with it. And a year, two years, three years later, I'm out of here. And so I think it's a really important one. And we were discussing, so what is that? We don't have extreme weather, right? We don't have winters that are in the freezing temperature for months. We don't have heat that hits hundreds, let alone 90, let alone 80. <laughs> um, so we have mild climate. Um, for me, it was actually absolutely welcome. Every year in California, the Bay Area got seemed to get hotter and hotter. I got more and more miserable. And so for me, it was like a breath of fresh air, and I don't mind the red, although this winter pushed it a little bit. Um, but what we were discussing, that somehow it's almost like the weather massages us. And, and it kind of works with us in a sense, and it, like, and we also get these really extremes—not extremes of temperature, but these extremes of glorious sunshine, mm -hmm. unbelievable clarity in Mount Rainier, and it's just like, oh my God! Two, you know, that kind of feminine misting rain. Twi Sometimes so it's almost in the same day. And, so, and, yeah. and like today, yeah. today's a perfect example. Is it fall? Is it in the summer? Is it winter? What? And you know what? I think it forces. Um, our resilience and our adaptability and our flexibility to be able to go with the flow. And we can't, I think it makes it hard to be rigid here. So I think that really that weather also has one of those things that um, kind of like a, fi a fire of a putter, it just keeps working with us. And as long as I think if we're meant to be here, I don't think everybody's meant to be here, and I wish that people that weren't meant to be here would follow their dream and their passion and leave if that's what they're meant to, because I can't stand the whining about the weather year after year. It's like, please go where, where you need to be. And I don't mean that judgmentally, because I have no attachment to where that is. It's just find your own passion and place where you fit. That's my wish for that. Um, but I just think that there's something about that constant change you know, it's like, forget the umbrella, forget the raincoat, whatever. It's just going to be what it's going to be. And I think that that does something <laughs> to us as a community. Well, that's kind of what I thought. Can you think of anything different? Um, no, it's, it's messed with a lot of my experience. The first um, month I moved here was April. I had a non-rainy day in 2000. <laughs> I spoke to somebody else that had summer, but every year they moved here from like May to September, it didn't rain. I don't know what year that was, I think it was about 12, 13 years ago. It was almost, it was almost like sunshine every day for like two or three months. So God knows what year that was, or was there a perception of it. But it was like, and that was the year they moved here. <laughs> You're lucky you made it. So one of the things we talked about in terms of weather, maybe you could speak to this, is how it operates in many ways, the way things like uh, the recent earthquake or the uh, Hurricane Katrina or stuff like that. I'm not sure what you're pointing to. But. Well, point to it as being a kind of community bonding experience. Ah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, how many people have been through power outages and the winter snowstorm and, you know, <laughs> In a sense, it doesn't paralyze us. It just um, it changes things, and all of a sudden, there's a sudden, and everything's different. And for those people that haven't experienced power outages and kind of things shutting down or everything, and it's not shutting down. That's actually not the right word because it's not like everything shuts down. It's just it just changes. And it's weird. I never would have thought of that I would get mad at people with generators, but it's like. There's like all of a sudden, well, if nature wanted us to be quiet, then dang it, it should be quiet. <laughs> but, but there is, I laugh because I don't really care, but there's this sense of when things shift, we go with that. And all of a sudden, well, if uh, businesses are going to close because weather's meant to shut us down, that's what we do, and we do the best we can, and people will coalesce in, in communities where there's heat and light and generators. And I don't know, I think it's one more thing that draws us our... Our, um, our connection closer as a community. And again, we can't just run off so easily and run away, and it's dangerous to do that, right? So um, I like hearing stories about people that one person had a generator or something, but basically all the people on the block then came together, you know, and they hung out for the night. Or just a ritual of, well, power's out, so it's candles, and that's gonna be that way for a day or a night or whatever. And you start to let like, go of it the first you're like calling every two hours PSE, right? The first time you're here with everyone, right? 
Um, and then it's like, whatever, it's going to come on when it comes on. <laughs> what am I going to do about it? Here's what I want you to know. What? Every single power outage that's happened since I've been here, yes. the moment I drag the generator out of the, <laughs> out of the garage, drag it over to the well house, get everything all hooked up, plugged in, start it up, the power is <laughs> So we should call you, right? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. so. One of the things I like about the winter here, I, when I came to look at your house, it was that big snow a couple of winters ago. You know, so I was looking for houses in the snow. Still love the house in the snow. And I like this feeling that ha I feel it when it starts to snow and everyone goes home. <laughs> It's kind of like, get to the bottom of your drive and then stay there. I really, I mean, you can just see it happening. People leaving the grocery store, people leaving everywhere to go home. I think it's a great feeling when that happens. I love that feeling. Well, I, think, I think that speaks a lot to the way we are as a community, too. Mm -hmm. There's this balance between doing and being in community and coming back home. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I say that, it's like, but everybody does that everywhere. But there's still something different about it that I'm trying to point to. It's we're constantly making that choice to be active in community and go to one of 10 million things that are happening on a Saturday night. Or you know what it's really meant for me to be home right now. And that kind of, for me, when we speak about some of the things, which we will later, of what's different now for me? You know, having lived here for a period of time, and, and for you, one of the things that I noticed was I'm not... Um, I don't lightly say yes to things, absolutely, or I'm clear with it's my intention to be there and I really plan to be there, but if something shows up and I'm not meant to, then I won't, and if that's not okay, then I don't give that tentative yes, and there is that ability to, to stay present and spontaneous with what's true for me now, and trusting also, you know, I know I do my best to say please register, but I don't count on you doing it. But I still ask anyway, so I know whether to set up. But I still plan knowing that people are going to responsibly make that choice here more than I've ever experienced based on how, how it rings true for them. And I don't want somebody here if they just promised because they were going to be here and that's why they're here. You know what I mean? So for me too, it's like that. So when we had a great summer party, you know, there were like 100 people invited and, you know, 60 showed up. But the 60 that were supposed to be there were exactly the ones that were supposed to be there. And, and that's fine. That's why we have potlucks on Libby. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not caterers. Yeah. No, I didn't mean that. Really but, yeah. um, but really, there's that sense of um, checking in, being home. Do I need to be home? Do I need to be out? And I think we're always weighing that decision more consciously than I was anywhere else. Okay. This might be a good time to segue into the piece that we talked about where we'd like to ask you to complete a sentence. And it's a short sentence. The sentence is, since moving to Whidbey Island, 